you are looking at something larger than life. That is the part of the experience of the movies that is unduplicable and that you're sitting there and you're looking at a screen that is 40 feet wide by 20 feet high and you are seeing things, you are experiencing something that is larger than life. The experience of television or looking at something on a computer screen is that you are watching things that are smaller than life, not larger than life. And what's going on now and has been hastened by COVID in a, in a way that may be totally revolutionary and change everything is that movies are being shrunk down to television size. Welcome to Post Corona, where we try to understand COVID-19's lasting impact on the economy, culture, and geopolitics. I'm Dan Senor. Will we ever go to the movies again? That phrase, go to the movies, like it's an outing, a shared experience, shared with a theater full of strangers. It already makes me nostalgic, like listening to vinyl records. But before the pandemic, the movie theater business was an $11 billion plus industry in the U.S. alone. In 2020, there were approximately 40,000 screens in 5,798 theaters that employed over 115,000 people. And U.S. films found an even bigger market in theaters globally. Then, of course, in March of last year, like all communal entertainment experiences, they were all shut down. Netflix, Amazon, and Disney, which were already increasing their market share of the movie experience, replaced the movie theater overnight. But as we crawl out of the pandemic to a post-corona world, will the tension build to return to the movies? Right now, we're seeing early signs of a market for the sanctity of the movie theater experience. So to help us understand the history of the film business and where it goes from here post-corona, John Podhoritz returns to our conversation. John's been a prolific film critic for over four decades. He's also editor-in-chief of Commentary Magazine and host of Commentary's award-winning daily podcast. He's a columnist for the New York Post, a book author, and was film critic for the Weekly Standard and television critic for the New York Post. Are movies as we've watched them? for the past half century, over? Were movie theaters already in decline and the pandemic simply accelerated the race to the inevitable? Or are we itching to get back out to go to the movies? This is Post Corona. And I'm pleased to welcome my friend and longtime film critic, John Podhortz, to Post Corona. Hey, John. Hey, Dan. How you doing? I'm good. Good. I'm good. I'm just um, I'm basking in the afterglow of your son's uh, bar, Zoom bar mitzvah. You and me both. It wasn't. Yeah, it you know, was, it, it wasn't was, only Zoom. You no, know, it was real. It was. Uh, it was. Uh, you had what you said. You had 45 people. 45 uh, people all outdoors. all vaccinated, all yeah. tested. Yeah, and just, it was a. Uh, it was. He was amazing. So I am. This was. Uh, this was uh, five days ago as we're taping, and yeah. uh, and I'm still uh, uh, jealous of the. Um, <laughs> The superb Hebrew that he displayed, and the and the sangfa, the poise, and everything like that. So it was a pretty, it was pretty great. And I, I don't know how you feel, but I'm just, I'm and, still, and just I'm, to be I'm, clear, I'm, I'm, I'm still just on to a be high clear, from it. You, you, I think sat through most of the three and a half hour service. I mean, I, I can go to indeed. the, I can go to the tape. We have the Zoom recording, so I can see when I, you dropped off. But I'm pretty sure you were on there for most. I did of indeed. It. I, I was there for. I was there certainly through your son's. Dvar Torah, uh, which is the which is the analysis of the Torah portion that he mm-hmm. read, and then and then on into the I think I think the rabbi's sermon came before. I I, mean, I, yeah. I, I can't remember because I'm just still so bedazzled by You're the whole so, experience. Right, right. You're it was so just overwhelmed whole, with yes, just, over right. overwhelmed. Yeah, I will say one interesting factoid that occurred to me the other night when my mother and I were were uh, deconstructing the whole uh, couple of days. So my mother made Aliyah from Canada. She was living in Canada. She made Aliyah in the summer of 2014. Uh, interestingly, during the Gaza War, she made Aliyah. And um, had she still been in Canada, she would not have been able to make it in person to our son's bar mitzvah because I have friends in Canada who wanted to come and couldn't come because they are not vaccinated. And uh, and even people her age are just now 
not all of them, but just now people her age are just getting their first shot in Canada. And she's been vaccinated since late last year, early this year uh, in Israel. And so I, you know, this has been a very difficult year, but when you look at the sort of miraculous uh, developments that we focused on quite a bit on this podcast, uh, from the development of the, you know, the mRNA uh, vaccine, uh, vaccines, when you think about the fact that this, that this, that this uh, pandemic has barely touched children. And when you think about how some countries like Israel got it together so early on the vaccination front, it enabled my mother who, you know, w- w- for a period there, wasn't sure if she was going to be able to attend her son- her grandson's bar mitzvah, be able to attend. So, yeah. um, okay. So we're going to talk about the movie theater industry. One would think that COVID decimated just about any industry, at least in the near to medium term, any industry that's in the kind of, any business that has us cheek to jowl with other people, right? Sitting on airplanes, sitting at sporting events, sitting at live theaters, you and I have talked about on this on this podcast, sitting in movie theaters, sitting in restaurants, sitting on subways. Um, the, any of those kinds of industries would be in big trouble, and actually they have been. The question is, will any of them be salvageable post-corona, A, and B, could some of them thrive? And the question I always get from listeners when we get into these topics is, will I ever go to the movies again? Go to the movies. That's the question. By the way, even that term, go to the movies, is an interesting term, <laughs> as though it's like an outing um, that you you and I grew up with. Grew up with. So, so that's what I want to... That's what I want to talk about. Will people go to the movies? But before we do that, I just want to talk a a little bit about your your small but not unimportant role in the whole go to the movies industry. (laughs) Because for, I would say, I'm going to show my age here, for decades I've been reading your uh, reviews. Well, you're you're showing my age more than yours. Well, I'm showing mine too. But look, I'm not going to, look, your first review was in 1978. 1979. I was, 1979. I, was eight, I was 18 years old. Yeah, I published my first professional review in the American Spectator uh, in my during my second year in college. In about the Warriors. About the Warriors. Yeah, the the movie about gangs, uh, the the uh, the gang trapped uh, in the Northern Bronx that has to get back home to to uh, to southeastern Brooklyn with all the gangs in the city uh, chasing after them. So. So you and then you've been you've been writing almost weekly or every other week for for about over four decades now and and who were you who have you written reviews for the range of publications just okay, a couple. so so I wrote for the American Spectator uh, from like seventy nine to eighty four eighty five something like that I then wrote for the I wrote intermittently for the Washington Times and for Insight Magazine which I uh, which was published by the Washington Times for from like 84 to 87. Uh, Then I kind of wrote stuff about the movies, but not on a weekly basis. Uh, In the early 90s, I ended up as the TV critic of the New York Post, which is, of course, not a movie reviewing job. But when the Weekly Standard started in 1995, pretty much from the time the Standard started from 95 until it was shuttered, in 2018, I, I I think I, uh, in the history of the magazine, I have had I had the most bylines uh, because I was in there most weeks. Yeah, the back for, of the magazine, for, the, the culture yeah. section, which was one which was one of my was my favorite part of the magazine. Yeah. It's what I started yeah. with whenever I got yeah. the hard copy. I'd go to the back to read your movie yeah. reviews. And until the pandemic, uh, sort of called a, sort of a halt to to it to some degree. I then moved on to the uh, Washington to the uh, Washington Free Beacon. So, um, so, so, so intermittently, about for a, a little more than forty, a, a bit more than forty years, with a couple of years gap in between. So, I've written. I, I can't even imagine how, how many? many. I mean, I've probably written two thousand reviews or something wow. like that. Or some, some. If you add in. If you add in TV, it's probably close to 2,000. Okay, so here's my question. Pieces. Yeah. How does a young John Pod Hortz yeah. become a movie critic? Like, how did you decide, 
I want to write about right. and publish about movies. Okay, so basically from the age of nine or ten, uh, so this would have been around 1970, I became, uh, I, I, I fell in love with the movies and I grew up in Manhattan uh, and Manhattan was not only a place where movies opened and played, but... Um, but you could get an education in in the history of cinema because there were all these revival houses, ten or twelve houses that played different movies every day, and of course the other thing that I, I, I have to remember is that let's say so over the course of the seventies, after school sometimes on the weekends I would go to the movies often by myself uh, and sort of get this education in the history of cinema, both for, uh, while seeing new movies. Now, there were two reasons that it was possible to become extraordinarily How old are well, you at this point when you're just going I mean, to movies? I'm a teenager. Yeah, teenager. I'm a teenager. Okay. Yeah, like, like an, a young teenager. But, but here's the thing. So the, the, the movie industry itself had only been around after the silence had basically only been around for 40 odd years. And so now it's been, 80 or 90. So if you were my age now, the amount of material you would have to know to consider yourself literate enough to talk knowledgeably about the cinema was much, much smaller because there was much less time and a lot fewer movies were being made. And in the 1970s, when American and foreign movies were being made, a lot fewer of them were released. Like there would be one, maybe two a week uh, that came out. Uh, the studios uh, sort of folded up. Uh, it was only in the 1980s that uh, enormous amounts of ancillary money came into the business in the form of uh, VCRs and cable television and stuff like that so that there was suddenly a lot more investment capital to go into movies because there was a lot more way there were a lot more ways to make money from movies aside from releasing them in a theater and then selling them to television and so there just weren't that many made so by the time I started writing about it I had probably seen most of the movies released in America from 1972 to 1978, 1979. I stayed up at night watching movies on TV, and I went to revival houses. So I was, oddly and ironically, I was sort of like as literate as would be necessary to write knowledgeably and with some command of movies, even though I was not yet out of my, my teens. And that's a thing, by the way, like the movie director, Peter Bogdanovich, who started out writing about movies largely for a program that was handed out at the New Yorker movie theater on the Upper West Side in the early 1960s. He also was like 20, 21 years old, something like that. Like Truffaut and Godard, the French directors, they were writing for French film magazines in their late teens and early 20s. It was kind of like a very young person's game at that point because you could because you could master it, you know, whereas if you want to write about literature, you got you got 10 centuries. You want to write about anything right. serious, like you just need to know more. Right. So it wasn't that hard. That's all I'm saying. And when you and when you would write film reviews did you even even when they became incredible you know very available on television and then ultimately on tablets and computer screens do you, for purposes of writing reviews do you prefer to be in a theater oh i i find it look i guess i could have written weekly for the washington free beacon this year uh because movies were being released on demand or you know uh on premium services or that sort of thing all the time, I don't really find that like watching a movie, um, and uh, and I, it doesn't generate any excitement. It doesn't. Ge I find it very hard to hold my attention, particularly if I'm in my house and my kids are running around or whatever, and they're not. They don't want to sit around watching the kinds of things that you can watch. So I wrote three or four reviews this year. I reviewed the Tom Hanks movie Greyhound. Uh, which is about a, the the war in the Pacific, the submarine war in the Pacific, and a, and a couple of other things. But I mean, I, just before everything fell to pieces, uh, there were two very interesting experiments in this question of what was going to happen to movies and movie theaters, which is that uh, Netflix paid for 
Netflix or Amazon, I can't remember who did what here, but the Coen brothers, who of course are like probably the premier American filmmakers, made a movie called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, and they made it for, I think, Netflix, and then they wanted it to be in theaters, and Netflix is like, we don't care if it's in theaters or not. And Netflix also paid, I don't know, $150 million to make The Irishman, Martin Scorsese's movie with Robert De Niro and, and Al Pacino, yeah. and he wanted it to be in movie theaters, and they were like, okay, well, we'll, we'll release it in some movie theaters, whatever. Um, but it's of no it's of no interest to us whether it does it could make a billion dollars at the box office not that either of these movies could make anything close to that it it has no effect on what we are and what we do so we're going to be nice to you and in fact netflix even then kind of bought a theater in new york city uh the paris theater next to the plaza hotel uh to show movies to like be nice to its the people who wanted their movies to be released but their model, their financial model, their purpose, how how has nothing to do with grossing but at the for box you, office. So take the Irishman. Did you yeah. wait, you reviewed the Irishman? I reviewed the I went to see the Irishman okay. at a movie theater. But you and have, then I watched but, but what it is it on, about yeah. the but what is it for you about writing a review in a theater? Is it the screen? Is it the size yes. of the screen? Is it the sense of going out the event? Um, is it the shared experience, the communal event? Like what well, what, of, what what is it? It's all of it together. I mean, as, if you take if you take it apart from like what does it mean to write about something, uh, it's much easier to write about movies if you see them in movie theaters because you are d- distractions are eliminated the way that they're not eliminated if you watch something on a computer screen or even on a big TV screen that's you know attached to Netflix or something. You're in your house. You can stop. You can go to the bathroom. You know. You can take a phone call. You can have your you can have your phone on your lap, looking at email, that sort of thing. And you can't lose yourself in the experience, or it's a lot harder to lose yourself in the experience. Take that, and then also take just the sense that you are looking at something larger than life. That is the part of the experience of the movies that is unduplicable, and this is where we're going to get into the real meat of this conversation, that you're sitting there and you're looking at a screen that is 40 feet wide by 20 feet high or larger, and you are seeing things, you are experiencing something that is larger than life. The experience of television or looking at something on a computer screen is that you are watching things that are smaller than life, not larger than life. People in a movie are often taller than they would be in real life. If you have a close-up of Robert De Niro, his face is 10 feet high as opposed to what his face would ordinarily be, which is like a foot and a half, right? Mm -hmm. So so our experience of television for the range of television is that it's a much more intimate medium and much more familiar. Like there are people there in our living room. We're inviting them into our living room. Uh, you know, your your wife, Campbell, worked on TV the whole, you know, for a long time. Mm-hmm. And the whole experience of being a person, a personality on television is, is this somebody I want to, like, be sitting in my living room? That's not what we think of or what we should think of or what we have thought of about movies. These are larger than life, epic, mythical people, practically. They don't really, they don't exist in our frame of consciousness. They're kind of mysterious. They're weird. They're off, they're off, they're, 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 we don't have that feeling about them that we can have about TV people and what's going on now and has been hastened by COVID in a, in a way that may be totally revolutionary and change everything is that movies are being shrunk down to television size, even though TVs are getting bigger, right? So you now have a TV that's a hundred inches long in your in your living room if you i don't but i mean if you have a wall big enough for that mm-hmm. you have a, a huge television which has good sound you have a sound bar it has good sound and all of that and you can hear things better you can put on captions so you can make sure you hear or you understand all the dialogue all of that stuff but it is a fundamentally different experience it's not the same experience and it's not the experience that generates an audience a repeat audience in the same way so, so yeah the, yeah the director of did you see 1917 yes so the sam director mendes. Yeah. sam mendes so do you remember his speech actually it was i think it was the last award ceremony i think it was the golden <laughs> globes before covid right. yeah uh where he gave that speech where he kind of did this finger wagging thing at the hectoring almost the 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 larger television audience of the awards saying Go to the theaters. Go watch movies in theaters. It's not the same. And 
I, I, I watched that. I, I, I thought the film was terrific, and I, I, I took his point. I mean, I sort of agreed with it, but I thought it's a bad sign if a movie director has to <laughs> yell at yeah. the audience. Yeah. Um, that, you know, the, the, the audience instinct is to consume content one way, and the director is sort of, you know, um, yelling at them um, that they're watching <laughs> it all wrong. Yeah. Well, but I mean, that's part of what's going on here is, and this is the ultimate question is, the movies have been a dominating cultural medium now for a century, pretty much for a century. The first global star was Charlie Chaplin, came, became a star in the 19 teens. It was in the, you know, the, the, the most popular movie ever made by some lights was Birth of a Nation. More people saw Birth of a Nation, so it is said, than saw any other movie in the history of mankind, in part because there was so little else to see. Uh, they built these movie palaces. Uh, th this was a new form of mass entertainment. People flocked to them, and they were off to the races. And that was 100 years ago. 100 years is a long time. It's a long time. Now, but the, now the theater, of course, with probably gaps of a thousand, you know, the Middle Ages, there wasn't a lot of theater. But you had Greek theater, you had Roman theater, you had Elizabethan theater, you had French Moliere, Comedy Francaise theater. You had theater throughout, you know, throughout the recorded history of the West. Um, so it's kind of an offshoot of that, but it's a it's, it's hundred years. So if the time has come because of technological changes and computer, whatever, uh, that this, this has become a calcified thing where people don't have to come together in one room to see one showing of one thing. Maybe it's organic that it's gonna end and that it's gonna be, it's being replaced by something else but uh there's other stuff going on that's not so organic and it's more financial than it is organic mm -hmm. bring it okay so in a good year last year before covid the entire american movie business grossed 12 about 12 billion dollars at the box everything. office that's everything. Right. That's not that's not video, that's not video on demand, that's not DVD. It's nothing. It's just box office receipts. Yep. 11 billion dollars. And just to be clear, this whole term box office receipts, which now people in the industry, industry players follow religiously. That is also a more recent phenomenon, right? It's only like in the 70s or 80s actually Nobody when you ever knew. Started well, people as people knew that things were hits, right? I mean, it was known that you know the that the graduate right or Jaws took off or Jaws yeah. or the Godfather stuff like that, right. but but it was it was literally the mid nineteen seventies before box office receipts box became office a thing. receipts they, became a news story, right? And I remember right. once being quizzed by somebody. It was interesting, like when I was a very young man, and somebody said, "Okay, so The Graduate was the number one grossing movie of nineteen sixty seven. Guess what number two was?" And I was like, I thought, tried to, I remembered what was it. So I was like, was it Funny Girl? No. Was it this? No. Was it that? No. What was it? The Green Berets. John Wayne's The Green Berets, which is a movie. And this is sort of interesting because there you had the cultural divide in the United States. You had The Graduate, which is a movie for sort of like young hipster draft dodgers and the green berets which is a movie for people whose sons and daughter you know sons and whatever went off to vietnam and one made a zillion dollars and was the cultural conversation of the moment and the other made a zillion dollars and was condemned by the new york times and was hated by everybody and all of that so but i i didn't know the answer to that question because people didn't write about the box office but when the blockbuster age began with jaw with Godfather, yeah, not, Godfather, yeah, 19, Exorcist. Yes, yeah, seventy five was Jaws. Yeah, but seventy two was the Godfather. Seventy three or seventy four was the Exorcist, and then came Jaws, and everything broke wide open. Right, movies made four or five times more than they had ever made before. And Superman, then, what was Superman seventy eight? Yeah, you know. but Star Wars, and then Star yeah. Wars just right. you know Star Wars. The entire industry altered itself because suddenly, you know, you could make something that made a respectable amount of money and doubled your money, or you could make something that made 20 times your money. And if, so, of course, if you were in this business, you were going to aim 
for the 20 times your money as opposed to the the double your money. And so the whole way everything went. And then that also transformed things because they were doing interesting things with sound. So theaters had to upgrade their sound systems. That's where Dolby came in. And 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 uh, cinematography, uh, special effects stuff became more sophisticated, and so you had to make sure that projectors had good lights and good lighting and good light bulbs and stuff like that. And theaters were getting a lot more attendance, and people were getting annoyed by how grungy they were, and so theaters started upgrading themselves, sort of like the way in the 1980s everything in America got nicer, people got richer, the country got richer, there was twice as much money, and so, like, you know, the streets got cleaner, restaurants got right. nicer, houses got nicer, movie theaters got nicer. Right. the economy grew nicer. by a third. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and so movie theaters, you're saying box office receipts about 11 to $12 billion a year for the yeah. in recent so, years. So let's say 11 or $12 billion. So that's good, like, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is, it's actually pretty static. So pretty much it seems to have hit a ceiling. It hit a ceiling somewhere around 2010, 2011. It makes around this and not much. Sometimes it makes $400 million more. Sometimes it makes $400 million less. But it was it's around $12 billion. And then, you know, uh, a couple of the main thing that happened, the main disruptive thing that happened, I think, that is going to change everything is that AT&T bought warner brothers among mm -hmm. other things that it bought in the network mm -hmm. of you know buying the entertainment companies so warner brothers is the second most profitable studio in hollywood next to disney and you know had a made a lot of money and in, in, in this in in this realm like made you know two or three four billion dollars a year in profit or something mm -hmm. like that but then it's purchased by a conglomerate that makes or grosses $182 billion a year. Mm -hmm. So from being a gigantic player in this big mar in this market, this very showy market, mm -hmm. suddenly Warner Brothers is a teeny tadpole swimming in a gigantic, you know, uh, aquarium that is dominated by AT&T. Mm -hmm. And um it doesn't really matter that much to AT&T, although it paid a lot of money for these properties. And suddenly, what it means for Warner Brothers to be a success inside its new ecosystem, inside its new corporate ecosystem, changes completely. You know, like, if you went in old days, you went from grossing $4 billion a year five to seven or eight, right? If you Disney made this huge surge and became the most profitable and powerful studio by dominating the market with, you know, by making a billion dollars more than Warner Brothers or something like that. So let's say you're Warner Brothers and you go from four billion to five billion. So so what? You know? Right. Like so you threw another couple of quarters into the, you know, into the kitty, the the AT and T two hundred billion dollar a year kitty. So if you're the guy who runs Warner Brothers, what are you going to do? You want to make some noise. You want your corporate bosses to light. You want to do something big. And so what's the hot Wall Street subject? What's the hot subject of the moment? Streaming. The future is streaming. Streaming, streaming. Netflix. Look at Netflix. Look at the Netflix play. So Netflix, of course, is a company that has never made money. Netflix loses Netflix's model is that it loses money and then the stock price grows. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can that's why you are who you are and I am who I am because you understand why that is and I don't. <laughs> and you know, I, and you know, if I understood why that was, I could have bought Netflix stock in 2007 and I would be a happy man today, but I didn't because I'm like this company doesn't make money, so why would I buy the stock? But and it has a massive I, stock price which it uses to buy content. Right. That the traditional and, media companies could never compete with. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so it's so Wall Street is like we want streaming. Future is streaming. All of this. So Jason Kyler, the guy who runs Warner Media, says, "Screw theaters. Screw you know. Th th this is nothing to me. This is like I want you know. I want my corporate chieftains to think well of me. So I in the Bake Off later on when I want maybe can become CEO. I want to show." that I know how to play with the big boys. So what does he do? He reorients his entire business towards streaming. And COVID then provides him, is not a tragedy for him, 
but an enormous opportunity because it disrupts the entire way in which movies are distributed. And he didn't have to. It's not clear why AT&T bought Warner. I don't know what it is. I don't understand. They need content for their, for their, the things that they want to sell, right? I mean, they, they, they want to, well, they Amazon. want to give I mean, Amazon you, is the example Amazon, because Amazon right. is, is, is buying up content. Right. Everywhere. Right. Everywhere. Uh, it seems though that they're not in the they don't need to be in the content revenue generating business. They are in the get eyeballs to Amazon business for a variety right. of reasons. Right. So that's it or AT&T also like they want something to sweeten the pot so you'll you'll sign up with AT&T. So they want to give you HBO Max for a year. So it turns out if that's their play and where they're going to make 100 billion dollars is on your AT&T phone contract, right? If you're the head of Warner Brothers or Warner Media, what you want to do is serve that interest, which is let's make HBO Max the best thing ever, and who cares about the movie theaters? And so when COVID came along, the movie theaters closed, and Jason uh, Kylar made this decision that he was going to release the entire Warner slate of 2021 on HBO Max for free. You know, if, as long as you were a subscriber, you would get it for free. So beginning, you know, and 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 Disney has followed suit to some extent. And so it basically he said, "All right, this is over with" because he already didn't really care about theaters and theaters had these restrictive deals with the studios where they said you have to give you you can't put your movie out on streaming or on DVD or anything. There needs to be a three-month window so that people will come to theaters and uh, and that'll be good. And, you know, we won't show your movie unless you have a three-month window. And then there was a big fight, and then they reduced the window to 45 days and then to 17 days. And then Kylar said, nope, everything goes on HBO Max. H uh, the minute that it's coming out, it's going to be there. And we'll also put it in theaters. So if you want to go to theaters, you can go to theaters. And right there, that is the end of the, that is likely, if it's not right now, maybe later, it is likely the end of the motion picture theater business. Okay. So let's, let's, we have, a, we have a real test case of whether or not you're right about that. Cause I'm not sure you're right. Cause Godzilla versus Kong just came out. All right. And in the middle of a pandemic, Godzilla vs. Kong opens in 3,000 theaters, which is a lot. I mean, that's almost half the theaters in the country. And in the first five days, box office is $48.5 million in the U.S. Globally, it's 200, over $285 million. They probably hit $300 million by now. It costs $180 million to make. So for a trans-corona theatrical film release those economics aren't terrible they're not but they're not they're they're not much actually if you want to really look at it it costs 180 million dollars is that what you said 150 yeah, 180 okay. million to make so it costs 180 million to make generally speaking promotional costs and stuff like that that's another 180 million so they're they're in for 360 million they need to they need to make 360 million and it's not just 360 million cuz let's talk about theaters now theaters get a percentage of the box office take now they get much less the first 2 weeks they get i don't know 70 they get 20% or something like that but in general it's said that over the course of the run theatrical release of a movie the studio gets 50% and the and the theater the 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 theaters get 50% so to make back, if you want the theaters to make back the money that you spent on it, right? The movie has to gross seven hundred million worldwide to break even, not one hundred and eighty million, because there's one hundred and eighty million plus promotional costs of one hundred and eighty million, or and then whatever carrying costs they had, or whatever interest stuff that they, and then so it's got to make seven hundred million dollars. So, uh, 
this did as well as you could possibly hope a thing would do in 3,000 theaters where people, they can only have 25 to 50 percent capacity. And people are, there's this, the, the, you could argue that there's people, there's people are yearning, there's a sort of tension right. building about around getting back to the theater. So the, right. getting back to the theater was an event in itself, which may not be as easy to replicate. Right. And of course, this is also, uh, so this is the fourth or fifth movie in a series of movies that were an effort to create what what uh, what uh, Warner Brothers called the monster verse because they wanted a universe like the Marvel Cinematic Universe so they were doing the monster verse the monster verse is Godzilla and Mothra and King Kong and they were they also had the mummy and uh, which was a, one of the worst movies ever made with Tom Cruise that went nowhere uh, and uh, Russell Crowe was going to play Whatever, it doesn't matter. So, so, so it's the monster verse, and they made Godzilla, and they made a second Godzilla, and then they made a Kong movie, and this is the fourth. Okay, so it's the fourth, and <laughs> your the point first... is how much longer are they going to keep doing this? Well, no, but it's like okay, so, so there's a lot. Of, they spent a lot of money to get to this point. Sunk costs. Movies that didn't make a huge amount of money, by the way, like the last. Kong Skull Island, which was the movie before this, basically broke even. It made five hundred million dollars. It cost two hundred and fifty million dollars, and by that formula that I told you, it basically mm -hmm. broke even or made you know made a couple of cents. So they're now making this. They made fifty eight million dollars or forty eight million dollars, and that's about as much as they're going to make. Because next week it'll they'll you'll see the box office numbers, and like all movies like this. The people wanted to go went, and now it's going to drop 70%, 60% or something like that. Then it'll make 24, then it'll make 12, then it'll disappear. So it'll maybe make $100 million, which is will be a triumph. But again, in a $182 billion corporation, what difference does that make? It doesn't make any difference. The real question for him, for Jason Kylar and for Warner is, what did it do for HBO Max? Did people watch it on HBO Max? Did they, did they like it enough on HBO Max that they're going to stick around and subscribe to HBO Max again next month to watch the next thing that's on HBO Max that's been released instead of to theaters. But in terms of these these titles, you know, what they call the pre-aware titles, do you also worry, to the extent that you worry, on behalf of the industry, that it's just not as replicatable going forward? I mean, if you look at, like, the Iron, you know, the the superhero movies yeah. the film series you know when when iron man burst onto the scene in 2008 yeah and then there was captain america and there was thor and there was the guardians and there was right. galaxy and even captain marvel and so they kept going back to this well yeah and do you also question how much can you go back to this well if this is how you're rolling out these movies and there's so much content now so you can't create these national cultural right events and build these lexicons around these these movie releases um that that whole model in and of itself it seems pretty important to this tentpole uh movie release approach right well i think this is the ultimate thing right so marvel represents the the um the triumph of 21st century movie making, which is that this 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 thing that had been around for 60 or 70 years, which was the superhero genre that had had successes here and there and a couple of spectacular successes, suddenly they took it off into the stratosphere, largely for creative reasons. They they, they made really really good movies, and they made them over and and they started. They were so reliably good and so reliably entertaining for the audience. That they grew in force and power and 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 uh, and and audience interest and all of that, but yeah, as you said, that was 13 years ago that that Iron Man came out of nowhere as a great surprise, and uh, and it built on itself. And it and these are event pictures. They became event pictures, and there were this thing where they built up interest, they built up enthusiasm, and there came like with Avengers this opening weekend. And every theater in America practically was showing this one movie. Like you couldn't see anything else because of the way they build these multiplexes. You could basically show it in 25 theaters with the same digital print or whatever. And it made $350 million in a weekend, which had never happened. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Um, but it just was. Just the US. Right. But that was, um, and it made close to $3 billion in the US. 
But that was the end. That was the end game. That was the literal end game of 19 movies or something like that. 17 movies that had been made that built to that movie, to that crescendo. So in this universe in which you're sitting at your, your home with your television and there's TV shows and there's Ted Lasso and there's The Queen's Gambit and there are series and there's this and there's that. How on earth are you going to build one of these things that will – now, It's I don't really care. Like, I, who cares whether studios get a Marvel universe or not? That's not really – what's of interest but what what where this where this matters is that this experience of uh what the sociologist Emil Durkheim called collective effervescence which is the experience of a mass something that people experience together in in one place and that therefore makes it more enjoyable or more intense or more whatever uh this is a very big thing and 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 it is it is i think on the verge of becoming obsolete. The the movies are on the verge of becoming obsolete because the people who make them no longer have or have broken their uh their interest is no longer in putting these things in these buildings and having millions of people go to the buildings. They want millions of people to turn on their streaming service. And they don't care that much about the millions of people in the buildings. And in Disney's case, just to give you an example, Disney releases movies on Disney Plus at premium pricing, as they call it. So you pay, Disney puts up, uh, you know, I don't know, this this Raya and the Last Dragon or something, and you pay $30 for it. So here's what's interesting about that. That $30, that's $60, That's not $30. They're not sharing that with anybody. That goes directly into Bob Iger's pocket. It doesn't, they don't have to do anything. And so twice, like they can, they don't have to sell tickets anymore in the same way. But five years from now, how is anybody going to know that a Pixar movie is coming? Now, you could do it the same way you always did. You advertise it, you push it, you do it, whatever. But the event quality of the release of a movie that people are excited about that can build, you can build to it and make them go want to see it. And then that itself builds audiences over time, which is the other thing that you're going to lose, which is somebody who's 10 years old and loves a Marvel movie might, when he's 12 years old, love some other kind of movie, might like a romantic comedy, and then might like a, a, a gangster movie, and might like, and there you therefore, as is true of all people who love the movies, you build their interest in the in the whole ecosystem of the cinema. And without this common experience, it's gonna go away. And it just looks to me like the most of the people who make them, no longer have any real interest in 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 contributing to that experience. So even if there is even if you do have a situation like you have with with Godzilla versus Kong where 3000 theaters are open and people turn out not as in big numbers as they did before the pandemic but still in meaningful numbers there's still demand for it. I mean there you could argue though there's still a market for these big event movies even if the even if the you know, the movie companies, the studios, the streamers decide it's not in their interest, but there is a market like there'll be anticipation for Top Gun 2. There'll be, I mean, there'll be these event movies. So you're just saying that these movie theaters are basically going to close and they'll all be kind of niche art houses, art house theaters. And there will be actually no, there'll be no place to go for, uh, for, for this kind of experience that you're describing. Well, I mean, I think, for example, you're, I, forget 2021 or the things that have already been made, right? Top Gun 2 is coming. Steven Spielberg's West Side Story is coming. Uh, uh, In the Heights is coming. There's a whole bunch of things that are coming. Dune, uh, you know, $200 million version of the science fiction novel Dune is coming. And there are a bunch of Marvel movies coming. What's 2025 like? That, that's what I'm talking about. Not, not whether at the end of the pandemic... And in 2022, people are going to go to the movie theaters. But whether a year's pause in this whole experience largely 
uh, breaks people of the habit. And, you know, we know this happens, by the way. I, I know from my own experience, but I know it's duplicated in a lot of people. The baseball strikes of the of the 80s and 90s, or the 90s, really. I was a huge baseball fan. That was it for me. Like, it suddenly, you know, there was no more baseball. There was some season was canceled. And I, I never really came back. Like, it left my life. Uh, I didn't miss it as much as I thought I would. And when, the, when it came back, I didn't really care, or I cared a lot less, or I'd watch, you know, in September when things got hot. I didn't really know who was on the teams anymore and all of that because I just, I just, you know, my, 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 my frenzied interest broke. And uh, I just don't know if people are going to feel the same way about this. And, uh, and as I say, if the industry doesn't have, if the industry that makes these movies uh, and supports the rest of the industry that makes movies, like these big movies support the lesser movies. They not only support right. them because they give the studios capital to make money with, but the movie going experience is shared, you know, basically if you like a Marvel, like I say, if you like a Marvel movie, maybe 10% of the audience will take a chance on Minari, which is this little yeah. movie about Koreans in Kentucky that is really, really nice. Uh, um, or five percent might, or something like that. Or conversely, you know, the only reliable money makers aside from the Marvel movies are horror movies. And then every now and then, there's like a game changer horror movie, like Jordan Peele's Get Out, Get Out, right? Which came out of nowhere, made two hundred. But that was more than just a horror office. movie. I mean, that was right. That's my point. Quirky right. independent film. Yeah, yeah. It was an amazing piece of work. Cost five million dollars. Made two hundred million dollars, and like became a center of a, part of a cultural conversation. That'll never come out in the theater. I mean, like that'll be on that'll be on Netflix, and maybe it'll do fine. We won't even know because Netflix right. doesn't tell us. Well, okay. Know? So two points there. One, yeah. my Alan, who's who's the producer of this podcast and is a is a independent film junkie, uh, basically says this is a good thing because we're going to revert back to everyone focused on smaller budget, taste making, artiste, independent films. And, you know, and it doesn't even have to be that extreme, actually. He points out E.T., Back to the Future. I mean, there were these high quality films from a storytelling, a serious storytelling and creative perspective that weren't, you know, the Avengers, that weren't Godzilla versus Kong. And that's going to become the business. And there will actually be theaters to 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 release you know to release those films in and people will want that experience of going out it's a smaller industry but it's an exciting industry that's been overwhelmed by the tentpole strategy look that's plot that's a that's a uh, that's that's probably right to some degree but again the question is 2030 not 2023 like are, pe are people going to find this exciting? Are, are people going to want to invest? Let me put it this way. Right now, you've got the children of billionaires, right, who they want to make movies. So they want to make movies. They're children of billionaires. Megan Ellison, her brother David, uh, you know, I don't know, Bill Polad. They're also the people... And they direct movies, they produce movies, and they want to be in it, and they have enough, and they 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 use the family money, and they do lots of interesting things with it, and all of that. Uh, Ten years from now, those people are going to have absolutely no interest in making movies because movies Why? aren't going to be because they're not going to be at the center of the cultural conversation anymore. They're just not. They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna be off to. They're gonna be part of a of a general panoply of cultural products that. It's like if you've been home for a year, right? And what you really want to do is get out, right? You want to get out. The pandemic is over. There are things that you really couldn't do, right? You couldn't see live music. You couldn't go to a ball game. You couldn't go to a theater. You couldn't go to, you know, I don't know. For a lot of people, you couldn't go to Disney World. You couldn't do stuff like that. Uh, you couldn't go to an amusement park. Um, but you could watch things, and people watch things throughout this whole thing. And it just isn't going to, it's like now, okay, so this is the big question about something like Godzilla versus Kong or whatever follows it. Is it really worth it to me to go out 
like spend 40 minutes to get to the theater to watch that in the theater now get a babysitter people, take an uber yeah, get refreshments yeah. you're talking about yeah a couple hundred dollars by the time the yeah. night is done yeah so so and it's like or i can watch it for free i just don't know that's why the theaters are so freaked out about this whole question of the window that they used to have the exclusive rights to show movies in. it was the only place you could see them and what so when they were hot that's how they existed. Now, I do want to say one thing. I know I'm blathering on a lot, but I do want to say that um, theaters stink and they deserve what they're getting because they're run badly. They they price their concessions at ridiculous levels in order to gouge people. They don't keep the places clean. They're gross. They don't replace the seats enough. And all they do is whine about how hard it is to make a living in this business and nobody told them to do it nobody made them do it and they do it badly and if they suffer because people aren't just that excited to go back to the movie theaters because they stink um then they deserve what they get you know amc doesn't keep its theaters nice century theaters doesn't keep there are theaters that are really well run Alamo is well run. Landmark is well run. There, there are chains that do this well because they care about the customer experience. And then there are garbage chains that do things crappily and people, and, and now they're going to claim even more that they can't afford to do anything because their business is being harmed. And you're going to get this spiral downward where, you know, it's like, it's hard to get some people to but go. But this to, is what you're yeah. describing is the near, you know, near monopoly like industry that they were able to yeah. i mean up until technology so so you could argue that even before coronavirus yeah because of advances in technology now right. people as you said have 70 inch screens they have hd they have yeah. s- projectors they have surround sound they have in their homes yeah right so one could argue it was inevitable we were going to head in this direction yeah exactly and as then, i say it's a hundred years it's a hundred years that's a long time for this model, where you go to a big theater, where people go and they sit in a big theater, and they used to be selling points that don't exist anymore along the way, like they were air conditioned in the summer when no one had air conditioning, or you know they had popcorn and there was no such thing as getting popcorn anywhere except at a movie theater, or you know whatever. Like there were there were often there were newsreels and there and mm-hmm. that's where you could see things happen on newsreels before there was television, and so you know it's like. It was like a thing, and it lasted, and maybe it's over with, and I'm going to miss it, but I think it's over with. I mean, one way or another. Go ahead. No, one way or another, it's over with. It may not be over with now. It may may take five, but it's like one of those things where it, it dribbles out. It's like vaudeville didn't it wasn't like there was a moment when when vaudeville shut down. It was like, that's it, vaudeville has gone bankrupt. This is the last day of vaudeville, you know, or like okay, something but, like but that. Okay, but let me, your, our, our friend Rob yeah. Long wrote in, in commentary about, during the pandemic, he wrote, I thought, a very good piece about, as he put it, you know, Hollywood's having a nervous breakdown and they're blaming TV again. And he, he, he compared it to the 19, the early 60s when box office numbers were, were crashing. People weren't going to the movies anymore. And... The movie moguls then, according to Rob, were doing what they do now, which is blaming television. Although then they blamed NBC and ABC and CBS, and you know, versus today they're blaming Netflix and Apple and uh, and Disney. Um, and he, and he points out what what they soon learned is it wasn't actually that people were just turning to TV because they wanted the convenience of TV. It was that all the movie theaters were in cities, and in the sixties and seventies, everyone was moving to the suburbs, and suddenly, enterprising. American business leaders figured, wait a minute, if we build these multiplexes in the suburbs, in or near shopping malls, near the freeway, uh, we'll suddenly tap into this audience that wants to go out. And they didn't want to schlep back to the cities to go to a movie, but if they could go to a, a multiplex out in you know Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, or Westchester, or Bergen County, or wherever, they would do it. So he Rob's basically arguing that that if there's if there are good movies and theaters are open, right, they will find an audience. But let me just give you an example. So in 1987, I did a piece on the new American movie theater for U.S. News and World Report, and uh, here was the new movie theater. There was this guy in Boston. His name was Sumner Redstone. <laughs> no one ever heard of him. 
uh, you know, this, 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 this guy, and he bought drive-ins, he bought up drive-ins, which were sitting there on these big plots of land, like you said, like near highways. And then he took away the drive-in and he built these buildings and he called them showcases or eventually called them multiplexes. And they were sitting there with lots of parking and the seat that he put in that theater this is what I remember from this, you know, all 35 years ago. The seat cost $130, which was twice the price of an ordinary conventional movie theater seat. And what did it do? It rocked a little bit. It rocked a little bit. And people, and this was true when they started opening them in, in, in Washington, where, where I was living at the time, people drove an extra 15 miles to go to the multiplex in Centerville, because the seats were comfortable and they rocked a little bit. You went to the theater and people, and they had this experience, which is people would show up. They wouldn't even know what they were going to see. They had 12 movies and they would go because they were going to go there. And they liked, there were also some video games in the lobby and all of this. And that turned the experience into a more pleasant experience. My only problem now thinking about this is I don't know what they do. They, as I say, AMC and some of these chains are, are 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 lousy exhibitors, and they don't do a good job, and they don't make the experience very pleasant. But I just don't know what they can do to duplicate that thing, which is like, oh, it was so awful to go to the movies. Now it's really great, but what are you going to do exactly? Like, it, it's just not clear. Can you? I mean, maybe you could. You're now now they have seats that recline all the way back. I mean, you know, or they bring food to your seat or something like that. But again, that's all like that's all like putting lipstick on a pig. Like it's not going to make that much difference. And the difference between what Rob was talking about about the studios then and the studios now is that the studios are part of the destruction system. They are not part of the salvation system. Warner is a studio. It is no longer interested in 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 theatrical releases. I mean, it pays lip service, but it isn't. I thought at some point, look, Disney. For a long time, studios couldn't own theaters because of a consent decree signed in the late 1940s. Um, and the consent decree was lifted in, I don't know, 2017, 2018. Disney, in theory, should buy up all the movie or build movie Is theaters the Paramount, in America. The Paramount, the Paramount the consent decree. Consent decree right. right. So um, Disney made 60% or something like that of the money at the box office in 2019. Uh, Disney could build theaters where it showed all the Marvel movies and it had princess and it was a Disney store, right? It had princess dresses and you could buy the videos and you could mm -hmm. do this and you could, you could eat, you know, you could, they could have a character breakfast, you know, like at Disney world, they could walk around in costumes and you could take a picture with Mickey Mouse. I don't know. And they could do this all over the country. And I thought, oh, see, I look, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I understand. I really understand business because they're going to do this because they need theaters. Well, Disney has now followed Warner because they also are now this $100 billion company. How do I know this? Because Disney turned around and spent $70 billion buying Fox. I don't even know why. It doesn't make sense. What did it buy Fox for? I mean, people, no one can really make sense, though. Now it owns Fox. Congratulations. So, but now it's like this $100 billion. And they also need to go to Wall Street and say, we're doing great in streaming. Streaming, 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 streaming. And so they're not going to go around and, and invest $10 billion in, or you know, $5 billion in, in, in 200 movie theaters across the country because it's too little. It's, it's not going to make them enough money. Two, two final questions. One, what does it mean for these? I, I, I see, I understand what you say, what it means for these, these big blockbusters. And I see what it means potentially for the small, independent, artsy films. What does it mean for the, the middle? Like the, you know, there's this movie that just came out, this Bob Odenkirk movie uh, called Nobody. Nobody. Right? Yeah. So it's just, did fine, solid earner. Actually, you know, came out around the same time as, yeah. you know, in the same period as uh, as Godzilla versus Kong. Um, it obviously appeals to a different audience, but the industry used to make a lot of movies like that. It's like the all the the whole Liam Neeson genre yeah. of films. Right. What happens to those movies? Well, those movies. This what's interesting is those movies have, a, a, I think, a reasonably bright future on the streaming services because 
they're they, cheap to make. They, they're they're cheap to make, and they have this ready model, right? They're violent. They're for men. Uh, there's there's not a lot of talking, and there's a lot of action that that translates well internationally. Obviously, you know, business like Netflix is in I don't know ninety or to hundred countries or something like that. Half the things, if you go on Netflix and you're relatively adventurous, you look and they've you know they have like 150 Indian TV series that you can watch if you want to, and so they're they're thinking about this very much. I'm thinking more about things like the romantic comedy or like the sort of the in, it's already basically the drama, the the drama, the real life drama about a family and a crisis or a this or you know something happens Kramer versus Kramer I don't know like those movies that were once the heart and soul of award season and stuff like that those are already gone but then there was always a more reliable and not kind gone of like, and not coming back probably not coming back because right. they're not saleable like they don't have a thing it's like you know you got to see this cuz it's a thing or you know um so so Queen's Gambit, which is the, was this Netflix series mm -hmm. about this, um, you know, brilliant female uh, chess prodigy, you know, teenage chess prodigy. Fantastic and, series that my only gripe with completely yeah. sugarcoated how the Soviets behaved during right. international <laughs> chess tournaments at the Absolutely. Peak of the Cold War, but I won't digress. Yes. Well, no, no, but I, I only bring this up to say that, so there's the Queen's Gambit, which is like, so it's a series, not a, not a movie. Um but of course, it has to be. It's it's a girl chess player, right? That's if not that the novel is about a female chess player, and I I'm, I don't begrudge it. I'm just saying, could you make a show about a male about a teenage you know about about a budding Bobby Fisher? I don't think so because it's not a. It doesn't twist it. It doesn't take it in some different thing. But like movies about ordinary life and what people went through, those are all basically going away unless their stories about gay awakenings or pansexuality or you know or or what or have woke themes or something like that now you have all these middle brow movies that are like re litigating the 1960s from the from the radical perspective you know praising the Chicago 7 and praising Fred Hampton this you know thug uh Black Panther. This is similar to your criticism of killer. Broadway. I mean, you you yeah. raised the question when we talked when we did a conversation. You know, would, how, how could you make Hamilton today? Yeah, right. I mean, that was only six years ago that right. Hamilton that Hamilton debuted. So that shows you how fast things are going. And it's not that you couldn't. You could, but you know, people on social media will yell at you. And as we know from Major League Baseball, apparently the fear of just being yelled at on social media is enough to make you make these calamitous, gigantic decisions that turn into large scale social catastrophes. Uh, that we're going to have to litigate for a year over where the All Star Game might be. So finally, w the the just bring this full circle. So so the industry lived and died, and people like you who followed the industry lived and died by the box office numbers coming out every week. As we said, that's you know that 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 was a big that was a big um, way to kind of maintain a pecking order, if you will. Yeah. Um, and it was talent used it, and the industry used it, and critics used it. How are we going to know what's working now and what's not? We're depending on the streamers to tell us when their press releases, and they don't really want to tell us much. So, how do we I know what's know. working? I honestly don't know. Here's what I know because I have, you know, I have friends and family in the industry, and this is how it goes. They say, you know, Universal is really happy. Mm -hmm. Universal's happy with the performance of X. They called us, they said they're happy. <laughs> Maybe if they weren't happy, they wouldn't call us. They're happy. So we're happy because they're happy. So they're going to say they're happy. So we have to go to them to make the next movie. They're going to be like, we're happy with how that did. Let's make the other one. But there's no, <laughs> there's no data. There right. are no data. And so I, I don't, I, don't, I mean, it, mostly this is like a game so you can sort of understand what the American people are interested in or what the audiences are interested in. That's why box office numbers were interesting. It's obviously not as a critic. It doesn't matter how, how what a movie makes. It only matters how good it is and whether I can recommend it to you or not, right? Um, it's interesting, though, sociologically, if something really, you know, like, 
explodes outward like get out or something like that and what that what that might mean or portend or what kind of social lessons you can glean from the fact that it seems to find this audience that didn't really exist before that like the hand carving uh the hand stitching the bespoke nature of the movie each audience that is assembled for a movie that is successful is itself a bespoke thing it comes together it's not the same audience that was at the last thing and it won't be the same audience that was at the next thing. And so it's interesting, but, um, but you know, it's like, I will say this, which is the Oscars are coming up and um, no one has seen anything or cares about any single thing that has been nominated or made. And I noticed like the golden globes got 6 million people. The Oscars is usually the second or third most watch program uh, of the year in the United States on television. Nobody's going to watch it this year because no one has seen anything and nobody cares. And There's no that's national the conversation going on about, about any of these movies. No, and, and by the way, they don't really deserve it, what's more, because they're, they're – and, you know, uh, a lot of the things that might have that might have impelled that national conversation were held back, you know? Right. Like the most interesting movie – that would have come out in December, in my view, would have been the Steven Spielberg version of West Side Story. Because West Side Story, you know, 1957, Spielberg, best, you know, greatest director ever, never made a musical before. Uh, Tony Kushner, fancy radical playwright, writes a new screenplay. Um, uh, the movie is largely viewed as being horribly miscast. Spielberg really does know how to direct a production number. We know from a couple of things that he did, like the number at the beginning of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom or something in 1941. So this will be, a, you know, like a dancing movie and all this. And, and on provocative themes of racial conflict, you know, urban racial conflict that are obviously very hot. Um, but it didn't come out. And so there's like nothing to talk about. Like, what am I going to talk? I'm going to talk about a movie that's about a Black Panther or a movie that's about Ma about Malcolm X uh, and 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 Muhammad Ali or a movie that's about Jerry Rubin and the Yippies. And it's like, really, this is what I'm supposed to talk about? Is like leftist the one fantasies is that the of one revolution? You're about? Yeah, the, there's one night in Miami yeah. versus the Trial of Chicago Seven versus right. uh, Jesus and the Black Messiah and uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. These are three of the eight nominees for Best Picture. And you know what? Like, uh, whatever. I I don't like them, but you know, it's also like this is what we're talking about. Like, right? Your grandparents' fights over Vietnam, and you know, really? What are you kidding me? Like, Abby Hoffman would be two hundred and fifty years old today. Like, why are we even talking about him? Well, anyway, I am on Saturday night taking my kids to a drive-in movie theater, upstate New York to see Godzilla versus Kong. You go. You know what I saw this year at drive-ins? What? I, I went to a drive-in outside Soldier Field in the parking oh. lot of Soldier Field in Chicago. Wow. I went see? to one uh, Ferris Bueller's Day, day oh. Off. So that Another was like... Another classic well, a movie like right? that. that. That goes on Alon's list with Back to the Future and yeah. E.T. E. Okay. Okay, yeah. Right, but there's a... Right. That, that's a movie about a, a high school kid who takes a day off. Yep. <laughs> Try to sell that in the Netflix universe. Um, so, uh, first wheel's day off. I saw Mama Mia uh, on the uh, Williamsburg at a drive-in on the uh, waterline at Williamsburg, Queens, and then saw. Jur this is this is what it was like. I saw Jurassic Park uh, at a drive-in on Cape Cod because they didn't have anything else to show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Yeah. All right, so okay. we won't be going to theaters, really. Uh, I, don't, I, I mean, some of us will. Some of us will be going yeah, to but theaters, niche, but niche, most niche. of us won't. Right, exactly. Right. My point is, like, when I went to see Buster Scruggs, the Coen Brothers movie, right. and The Irishman, I saw them. They were vastly better in the theater than they were on television. And I saw them at a, at a theater. One of the theaters had 12 seats. <laughs> And one of the theaters had a hundred seats because it was one of these glamorous right. new sort of ritzy. And so you can see why Netflix doesn't care what its box office numbers are. Right. You know, right. it spent $150 million on the Irishman. It threw it in a couple of theaters because right. whatever. So, um, you know, in two or three years from now, they're not even going to do that is my, my view. 
John, thanks for this um, upbeat conversation, as always. <laughs> well, it's fine. You can, so enjoy watching things at home. If you enjoy it, it's you know, going to happen. If you don't get enough crushing morosity from the Commentary Magazine podcast, That's you, right. can, you can come to the post-corona podcast. Well, we can, talk about Midtown, we can talk about Midtown Manhattan. You know, we'll that would come be fun. back. We'll come yeah. back. We're going to okay. talk, actually. We're going to bring you back to talk about future of uh, post-corona politics. But until then, John Podhoritz, thanks for joining the conversation. Thanks. That's our show for today. If you want to follow John Podhoritz's work, subscribe to Commentary Magazine. Go to commentarymagazine.com and also subscribe to the Commentary Magazine podcast. You can also follow Commentary on Twitter at Commentary. If you have questions or ideas for future episodes of Post Corona, tweet at me at Dan Senor. Post Corona is produced by Alon Benatar. Until next time, I'm your host, Dan Senor.